In the 1850s, there was this unusual problem that began to get stirred up in the medical community, specifically related to women after they, were, after they had given childbirth. There was this disease that kind of sprung up called childbed fever, and it had a high mortality rate. Many women passed away because of childbed fever, and it, it happened a couple weeks, sometimes even months after delivering their child. And, and doctors, they tried everything. They tried to figure out, what is, what is this childbed fever? How are they contracting it? And they tried solutions and, and ways of, of bringing about healing, but no matter what they could do, they couldn't seem to fix this problem. And week after week, women kept passing away to childbed fever. On the scene came this doctor. He was, he was a bit uh, abnormal in his thinking. His name was Dr. Ignac Semmelweis, and he was a Hungarian doctor. And he proposed this radical idea that was backed by research. And this was going to change the medical community. It was going to change how doctors operated and, and how they went into their practice. It was revolutionary for the time. He said this, simply wash your hands. Now, that sounds second nature to us today, but in the 1850s, it wasn't uncommon for a doctor to perform an operation, not wash their hands, but just wipe them off on their clothes or on a dirty towel and walk in and serve their next patient. And what they found was that there was this cross-contamination that was beginning to happen that was leaning into childbed fever. And in fact, Dr. Semmelweis had all this research to prove this. But instead of the medical community adopting this practice, getting excited about this, they deemed it too elementary. Something that simple couldn't possibly lead to lives being saved, they reasoned. And they met Dr. Semmelweis in his work with skepticism and criticism. So much so, he made so many professional enemies proposing this idea of washing hands that he had to leave the city in which his practice was in, Vienna. He had to actually get up and leave, and, and things weren't looking good for him, and he was wondering, how am I going to get this research out? And so he wrote a book, but before the book even hit the stands in 1860, his peers had done some work. They, they told people that his work was elementary, that it used poor language, and that it overall wasn't going to make any significant difference. Dr. Semmelweis, he couldn't handle the the stress of that situation, and he suffered from bouts of paranoia, mental illness, depression, and he passed away five years later in a mental asylum, never seeing the fruit of his research that simply washing your hands can save a life. And I share that with you today to say this. Wash your hands! <laughs> Just really wanted to skip. No, that's not it. Okay, worship team, you can come forward. We're going to close there. And uh, that's our message for, no, I'm just kidding. No, no, I, I share that with you today uh, because we all have these motivations and we have these desires that, that cause us to live our lives the way we live them, to, to raise our families the way we raise our families, to pursue the jobs that we pursue, to, to go to the schools that we decide on. We, ha we have all these, these ideas and, and these de desires and intentions that drive us. I don't know if you've experienced this, but oftentimes those desires and motivations, they start off noble and altruistic, especially when we're young. Whether it's the job we want to pursue, the relationship, the family we want to have, we have this idea of making a difference in the world. But what I found is that as many of us can have pure and, and, and altruistic desires and motivations. It only takes a few bad days, a few bad experiences, a few bad bosses, a, a few bad experiences to derail those motivations. I can't say for sure what happened with those doctors and their minds as they had this idea proposed to them of washing hands, but I imagine that like many young college students going through medical school, they had an idea that they would make an impact in their community. They would go on and they would save lives through their medical practice, and, and that as hard as that medical study was, they were going to push through and they were going to make a difference, but then something happened in their lives. Maybe a few bad experiences maybe a little too much paperwork, <laughs> maybe too much happening 
not for the better, but for the worse, that slowly derailed those motivations and those desires. And suddenly the focus shifted from this selfless serving the community around them to serving themselves. See, if we're not careful, that exact same thing can happen to us. We can, we can get so wrapped up in, in serving others and we can have these good motivations, these altruistic motivations, but it only takes a bad day, a, a bad couple days, a, a bad job, a bad boss, whatever it may be, to slowly derail those motivations. And suddenly it's no longer about the kids, it's about the promotion. Suddenly it's, it's no longer about making a difference in your community, it's about making a difference in your pocketbook. Suddenly, it's no longer about serving the least of these. It's serving yourself and keeping up your appearances, even if it means cutting the corners occasionally with a little bit of dishonesty. See, there's this thing that can happen in us if we're not self-aware, if we're not careful, where our motivations and desires, even, even the best intentions, can be derailed and focused inward. We're in a sermon series today called Holy Fire, and we're wrapping up this sermon series. It's on the Holy Spirit, and we've been talking about how the Holy Spirit actually has the ability to form and and transform and uh, renew these motivations and desires so that they line up with God, so that we walk in step with the Spirit, and, and, and we have true motivations that align with who Jesus has called us to be. And next week, we're going to be in a sermon series called Pressure Points, which I'm really excited for. We're going to be looking at the book of James, and it's filled with practical, everyday how-to, how to to live in love like Jesus, how to to do it in your workplace, how to do it in your family, how to to do it at school. It's got so um, so much practical information for us. But this week, we're wrapping up this idea of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's ability to transform And the Apostle Paul, when he talks about this idea of the Holy Spirit transforming us, he calls it renewing our minds. The problem is, for many of us, is while we may start off with pure motivations and desires, we have this thing in us that we're at war with, this this idea called the flesh. We have kind of this, this desire to serve God on one hand and then the desire to serve ourselves. And if we're not self-aware, if we're not able to see it happening in real time, our motivations and our desires can slowly turn inwards until we're back to square one. I think the Apostle Paul was all too aware of this tendency. He called it quenching the Holy Spirit. You can think of it like the Holy Spirit being a, a bonfire, Doing, doing some sort of work, and then you just pour water over the top of it, you know. The Holy Spirit wants to do this mighty work in and through us and in our lives, and then sometimes, isn't it like we make a decision or two where it's just like pouring water over that? You make a mistake, you, you tell that lie, you, you treat someone else poorly, and suddenly you've quenched the Holy Spirit. And Paul was writing about quenching the Holy Spirit to a group of people that really needed to know and understand what quenching the Holy Spirit meant because it seems as though, as Paul writes the book of 1 Corinthians, that this is already happening in the lives of the Corinthian church. They're filled with sin and dysfunction and they can't seem to get along. And on top of this, they have tons of theological questions, which is not bad. Uh, we, we have to remember that for the first century church, they didn't have a Bible. Okay, so they, they, didn't, they maybe had a few scriptures they could go to. Maybe they had a gospel or two, but the majority of them couldn't read. The only time they could hear this read was in the context of a church service when a pastor would read it. And so it makes sense they have questions, but it seems those questions have led them to dissension and disagreement instead of unity as a body. They're, they're at war with each other. And so this letter, it's, it's foundational for this church to get back on track. And in chapter 12, which we're looking at today, Paul seems to be dealing with a topic that's causing a lot of dissension, a lot of disagreement, this idea of spiritual gifts. And it appears, at least in reading this passage, which we'll do in just a moment, that there was a little bit of jealousy happening. 
Jealousy when, when other people with certain gifts got different opportunities than, than other people. And, and Paul wants to make sure that their motives are right, that their perspectives are aligned with the Holy Spirit. Because Paul understands something that's true for the Corinthian church and us today. And that's that the absence of vision, the absence of mission, the absence of an understanding of who a church is called to be and the individuals that make it up is a fast recipe to dishonest motivations, disagreement, and dissension. It's a quick path to self-preservation. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 4. He says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. We sang that song, Same God on Purpose. You'll see how often Paul says this. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, in everyone, it is the, say it with me, same God at work. Meaning this, God gave each person in Corinth gifts. He gives each person here today different gifts. And, and my gifts are probably different than yours, and your gifts are different than the person sitting next to you. We all have gifts that God is using to edify the body, for us to come together and work together with our diversity of gifts and experiences to edify the church. Paul writes, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the, here it is again, same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues. Sorry, I cut off the bottom of this, so I'm I'm having to read up on the screen here. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So go ahead and look at your neighbor right now and say, neighbor, you're different. Go ahead, look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, you're different. Some of you said that with a little bit of extra something behind that. I don't know what that was. Maybe we need a small group on community relationship or something. No, no, we're, we're all different. We all have these different giftings that God has given to us. And it seems that for the first Corinthian, for the Corinthian church, they didn't understand the value of this. They, they didn't understand that, that this is a, a good thing for the body. Instead, they've become competitive There's resentment that has built up. And so Paul is is really hitting this home. He says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. And even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body every one of them just as he wanted them to be. And if they are all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. This church has slowly fallen into a trap that is not not contained to the first century church. In fact, it's a trap that if we're not careful, we could fall in today. It's a trap that many churches fall into. What what starts out as a noble effort to reach the community, to reach the lost in their city, quickly turns into survival and self-preservation. And if the first if the Corinthian church doesn't correct this soon, many people will die spiritually. Again, this is a problem isolated to the Corinthian church. I can remember moving to Nashville with my wife and some friends, and we were doing a bit of church shopping. 
And we were going around and visiting different churches and seeing where we wanted to get plugged in. And uh, I happened to be working this particular Sunday, so Hannah went with our friends to this church that was right down the road. And it was one of those churches, maybe you know what I mean when I say this, where um, there was assigned seating, but nobody assigning the seats. Do you know what I mean? Like one person always sat at the back, and that was their seat. They, they didn't claim it, they just always sat there. And so if you were new, you had to come in and kind of get a lay of the land and make sure you sat in the right seat so you didn't take somebody else's seat. It's a really good way to communicate to someone that, hey, this is my space and there's not a whole lot of room for you. Well, that seemed to do the job. It was communicating that to my wife and, and to our friends. Service went on with, without a hitch. I mean, there were a couple pleasant hellos that were exchanged But then came the end of the service, and the youth pastor got up, and the youth pastor in front of everybody resigned his position. Now, this wasn't just a nice, hey, thanks for your time, it's been really enjoyable, I'm going elsewhere. This was a, this wasn't so much a resignation, it was a a rebuke. (laughs) He got up there and he was like, you don't understand what you're doing. You as a church, you say you want to reach people, but you're so focused on your rhythms, your routines, your preferences that you're not making room for anyone, especially the youth. And I've got kids that want to come and learn about Jesus, but you're too concerned about your preferences being met. You can't make space for them. It's funny, my wife said after the the rebuke happened and they went on with their day, Uh, One of the ladies caught them at the door and said, don't listen to that guy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Come back. Needless to say, we didn't go back to that church. See, this is a trap that any church could potentially fall into where, where the concern shifts from being focused on reaching and saving the lost to self preservation. I've used this phrase many times. I heard Duane say it first. He said this, It's a tragedy that many churches in America look more like a mausoleum for the saints than a hospital for the sick. But that's what happens when your motivations and desires fall out of line with the Holy Spirit's motivations and desires. And what's tempting for me as a pastor at this stage in the sermon, as I was putting my sermon together, what was tempting for me to do as I put this uh, together is is to then shift here and talk about the importance of volunteering. You know, you got to get plugged in on Sunday morning. You got to use your gifts to edify the body. You got to sign up for the parking lot team for kids ministry. You got to make snacks. You you got to, we got to come together as a a body and do a big rah-rah speech where we get people to sign up to serve in different areas on Sundays. But the thing is, I read this passage, and I don't think Paul is speaking exclusively about Sunday mornings. I think he's talking about the church Monday through Sunday. Yeah, it's important for you to serve. It's important for you to find a place where you can use your gifts for the edification of the body, but it's just just as important how you live Monday through Saturday as you do on Sunday. Paul is, is commanding us to use our gifts Monday through Sunday for the edification of the body. And remember, this is from Paul. If we, if we understand his history a little bit, it, it kind of it, it brings it to light for us. It helps us understand Paul was a tent maker, meaning that when Paul went to a new city to plant a church, the first thing he did was he set up in a public square. He probably didn't know a whole lot of people, and he started fixing tents. And probably had some ability not only to fix tents, but he, he made tents. He, he could probably fix sandals or saddles or whatever it is. And he used that job as an opportunity to spread the gospel, to tell anyone, whoever would hear it, about the resurrected Christ. He literally worked the job. I mean, yeah, it paid the bills, but, but the deeper motivation, the deeper intention was to spread the good news of Jesus wherever he went. Paul had this motivation, this, this desire to know God and to make God known. 
He, he had this desire, and, and he, he let it drive every decision he made. His job was not a means to make money and buy a house. It was first and foremost a means to make God known. And I wonder at some point if we've shifted in our thinking a little bit where maybe that was the intention when we first started that job, but now that job is a means to make money and nothing more. Or maybe it's not exclusive in, in the job. You move to that neighborhood hoping to make a difference in the lives of your neighbors, but you just haven't gotten around to it. You might be thinking, well, that's real easy for you to say, pastor, because you get paid to do this sort of thing. Like, you are paid to do ministry, but what I've found not only in my life, but in the lives of my peers, is that it's all too easy for even a pastor, for even a minister, to fall into the trap of self-preservation and miss everyday opportunities to serve those around them. This uh, past Monday, I was stopping in at Dunkin' Donuts to grab my extra-large black coffee, no cream or sugar, pulled into the drive through and I didn't realize this at the time, but when it comes to Dunkin' Donuts, if you have the app, you have to, in order to pay for, your, uh, for Dunkin', you have to scan twice. So you scan first to get your rewards, and then you scan again to pay. Well, I pulled up, she gave me the coffee, I scanned, got my rewards, and pulled off. Didn't know that I hadn't paid, but as I'm driving down the road, I'm like, she gave me kind of a funny look. I wonder if there was something more to this. And so I started looking at the app and the transaction history, and sure enough, I didn't pay for my coffee. And I felt really guilty, and then I, I did all this justifying. You know, I was like, well, it's four bucks. It's Dunkin'. It's this big corporation. Surely it won't make a difference. And I just, I kind of had this moment where I was like, okay, God, I've got stuff to do. I've got a sermon to write. I've got meetings I got to do. Four bucks isn't a big deal. What should I do? And then I didn't hear the voice of God, but I got this very distinct impression in my mind. It was this, go back. I'm like, all right. So I pull a Yui. I go to the Dunkin' Donuts. And I walk in, and as I'm walking through that parking lot, I'm like, God, I don't know what you're going to do, but just, I, I guess, prepare me, give me the words to say, whatever it is you want me to say. And I get to the counter, and they're, they're real busy, and so that affords me time to kind of get a lay of the land as I'm waiting to come and confess that I stole a $4 coffee and like to make amends. And as I'm standing there, I'm hearing this group of, we'll call them curmudgeons behind me, uh, some grumpy fellows who uh, had some issues going on. And, and the conversation was, they were grumpy at first, they were complaining about stuff, but then that, that conversation slowly devolved into talking about women in their lives in a really negative, unbecoming way. And I'm like, oh God, did you call me in here to talk to these guys? <laughs> They finally come over the, you know, the, the cashier, and I, I explain my plight, and so sorry, I didn't mean to drive off, and they're like, it's totally fine, appreciate you coming back, but it's four bucks, coffee is on us, and I leave, and I'm driving down the road, thinking of the sermon that I'm going to write, thinking of, of the meetings I'm going to have that day, and I get this distinct impression of God saying, go back. And this time, I began to barter with God to try to convince him otherwise. God, I, I've got a sermon I've got to write on quenching the Holy Spirit. I, I, I've got people I need to see, people that are counting on me. And at this point, God, if you didn't open the doors back there, well, I, I'm sorry. I, I've got places to be. And, you know, I, I confess that even though I had that distinct impression of the Holy Spirit speaking to me in that moment, I didn't go back. And the irony of it is I went back to church, to this building, to write a sermon on why you shouldn't quench the work of the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, I poured water all over what God wanted to do in that Dunkin' Donuts. See, the reality is, is that even pastors, even ministers can fall into the busyness of, of self-preservation. 
meeting our own schedules, our own needs, our own meetings, and we miss everyday opportunities to serve those around them. You see, it's not an issue of what occupation you have. This is an issue with your preoccupation. What drives you, what keeps you up at night, what gets you into work in the morning, what, what drives you to get into the classroom or on the road. And for Paul, he had this desire to make Jesus' name known wherever he went, to work among people and build relationships that would empower people in their gifting to launch these small communities in the first century of believers. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but God has you there for a purpose other than just bringing home a paycheck. God has you in that job because somebody needs to know him. God has you in that neighborhood because somebody needs to see what a, a godly family looks like. God has you in that, that family or that friendship because somebody desperately needs to know Jesus. And what's amazing about God is he will use your gifting and my gifting, this, this diverse mix of gifts to accomplish his purpose in the world, to spread hope where it's needed most. And what's amazing about this is that as our desires are, are formed and shaped to live and love like Jesus. As we're molded by the time we spend with Jesus, we, we begin to truly experience that renewal of the mind, a, a transformed heart. And as we allow God to transform our hearts, it, it leads to transformed hearts, plural, impacting those around us, our family, our friends, our, our workplace. See, I'm convinced the world doesn't need more politicians to pass certain laws in favor of Christianity. The world doesn't need more motivational speakers or TED Talks or celebrities who endorse Christianity, although certainly those aren't a bad thing. What the world needs is everyday Christians living on mission, seeking to know God and to make him known. The world needs everyday Christians seeking to know God and to make him known. It was D.L. Moody who said, the world has yet to see what God will do with a person fully consecrated to him. A transformed heart leads to transformed lives. Transformed lives leads to transformed workplaces, transformed neighborhoods, transformed families, transformed schools, transformed churches. Look what Paul says when you're in step with the Holy Spirit. He says, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. See, here's what happens. As we individually and corporately seek to know God and to make him known, we become this body of believers with this diverse gifting where each person is fulfilling a role. And it's beautiful because we can say, man, I'm not really gifted in that area, but, but she is. Oh, I, I'm not really good at that type of thing, but, but they are. Oh, I am gifted in this area, and so I can fill this gap. And what happens, a result of these motivations and these intentions that are aligned with the Spirit, is unity Monday through Sunday. Unity of the body, and in a world that is so divided, that is so polarized, is so at odds with each other, we can serve as a beacon of light and hope to the world around us through our unity, through working together to achieve the common goal of knowing God and making him known, to living and loving like Jesus. I mean, can you see it? Can you, can you see the transformation that would begin to take place in your life, in your family's lives, in, in your schools, and in, in our workplaces, simply by coming together and working together as a church body Monday through Sunday? You might be hearing that today and think, yeah, sign me up. I want my desires, I want my motivations in alignment with the Holy Spirit. But, but where do you start with that? How, how do you get to that place where you, you allow the Holy Spirit to do that work in you? I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward as we, as we look at this. We have to first understand that if you've asked Jesus into your life, you have the Holy Spirit in you. 
and you have access to the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I think when it comes to aligning our motivations and desires with that of the Holy Spirit, it's helpful to ask a, a really simple question that, that might orient us in the right direction, that might help us begin to align our motives and desires with that of the Holy Spirit. So it's a question that uh, my small group of guys, we ask each other weekly, and it's a, a simple question, but, but I believe it'll, it'll challenge you if you start asking it this week. Who are you praying for today who doesn't know Jesus? Who are you praying for today who doesn't know Jesus? And some of you might be thinking, oh, I've got a list. But the reality is, as we've asked this question, we've also learned that some people don't have a list. That, that some of us, maybe what started off as noble intentions of, of seeking to make God's name known have, have slowly drifted and, and slowly shifted at some point. Here's, just, here's my simple challenge for you today. And it's really easy. Start praying for that family member, for that friend, for that coworker, for that neighbor. Start praying for them that they come to know Jesus. And then watch as the Holy Spirit opens up doors of conversation for you and that person. Watch as, as the Holy Spirit indwells within you and enables you to have conversations and to say words you didn't even have planned. Watch as the Holy Spirit transforms your heart to line up with the heart of God. My question for you is really simple today. Would you as a church body commit to praying for someone every day this week who doesn't know Jesus? Would you commit to, to allowing that simple prayer to shape your motivations and your desires and begin to align you with that of the Holy Spirit? God, we confess that there are times when we are on fire for you, that we are passionate about you, that we want to align ourselves with the work that you are doing in this place. And Lord, there are other times where we fall short where we pass up an opportunity to witness to those around us or for fear of what people may think about us, we stay silent. But Lord, each person here today has someone in their lives who desperately needs to know you. And so, Lord, I pray through the empowerment of your Holy Spirit that you would begin to move in this place that you would build bridges of connection to us and those in our, our work in, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, people we interact with every day. And Lord, I pray that we would see that the harvest is ripe in front of us, that there are so many people who need to know you. And what the world needs is more Christians who will seek to know God and to make him known. I pray that you would empower us to go out Monday through Saturday and witness the power of your Holy Spirit to share our testimonies of the good and deep and meaningful change you have done in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see the least of these. Those people who, who desperately need to know your truth, who need to hear the reality of the gospel, that you are for them, that you love them, that, that you are chasing after them like a sheep who has wandered off, Lord. God, I pray as we worship through this next song that you would impress on each of our hearts that person or those people who we need to pray for. And would you give us the boldness, Lord, not just to pray, but to be a people of faith and trust and action, reaching out and loving those who you have placed in our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hey, at this time, as we close with this song, would you stand and join us as we worship with one another?